So, Dodie, I'd like to do something a little bit different today. Tell me. Well, I had a conversation with Professor Eric Vermetten. He's a psychiatrist who's been working with the military in the Netherlands for the last 25 years, helping Dutch armed forces and uniformed people, so firefighters, paramedics and so on. And our conversation focused on the field of psychotraumatology, which was new to me. The interview was just absolutely fascinating. We began with what psychotraumatology is. We wandered our way through the use of new drugs and new therapies in the treatment of psychotraumatology, psilocybin, psycholotics and psychedelics, and the resurgence in the last few years of psychedelics as a therapeutic modality. Oh, wow. So those are all a bunch of new words, but we often introduce new words. What, what is different about today? Well, what I'd like to do, dear listener, is to give you the whole raw conversation. So this episode is a little bit longer than usual because I didn't really have the heart or maybe the brains to leave out <laughs> any of the conversation. So this is your long run episode and we all get to be flies on the wall now. So psychotraumatology is what matters today on Discovery Matters. My name is Eric Vermetten and I am working as a psychiatrist. I've been working as a military psychiatrist for the last 25 years in the Dutch Armed Forces. I was head of research for 25 years, so my focus in my professional life has been um, active duty service members as well as veterans. They've been returning from deployments such as former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan and so forth. And I am also working as a professor of psychiatry at Leiden University Medical Center, where I do research on post-traumatic stress disorder. That's the disorder that's close to my heart and where my professional life is focused on. And is the focus of the PTSD research across all sort of what you might call instances of PTSD, or is it largely associated with people having had experiences in conflict zones and in conflict situations? Well, my professional life has sort of focused on uh, uniform service members. So the answer is yes, that's about my main focus. And in research, we also look at civilian psychotrauma, but probably also throughout history, it's been a population that's been studied most uniform service members in military. And the knowledge that we have uh, about PTSD pretty much comes from that population by far. You said two interesting things there, which I think merit definition for our listeners. First, you talked about psychotrauma, but maybe let's get the distinction between a uniformed and a non-uniformed service member. Why did you make that distinction? Okay, well, you know what? Well, that's a very good question, Gar. I think when somebody puts on the uniform, they are, because of the uniform, exposed to potentially traumatic events. And as civilians, we can also be exposed to potentially traumatic events, but then it happens to us as we go shopping, as we do our daily lives. But these guys and girls choose to wear the uniform in order to defend their country or in order to be a policeman or in order to be a nurse or a professional in a hospital setting. So I think that distinguishes them a bit from the ones that are not wearing the uniform and are being exposed to these similar events, probably. So there's an element of kind of conscious choice to expose themselves to, frankly, a, you know, a danger, whether it be physical or whether it be psychological. So could you talk a little bit about psychotrauma then and what we mean by that? Psychotrauma is actually an event or a series of events that don't leave you untouched. I know that's a very ordinary definition, but that have such an impact that life's no longer the same. I could make it very technical, like you're going to be exposed to death or injury or serious injury of the self or others. That is the DSM classification of psychotrauma or a potential traumatic event. But in a sort of metaphorical way, it's like something that gets you under your skin. It's going to be there forever and it's going to change the way you look at yourself and look at the world dramatically in a kind of a negative way because you wish that life was the way it was before. It isn't. And I assume that these, the results of these kinds of traumas, they manifest themselves very differently for different people. Do you sort of categorize the manifestation in any way? We do, we do. And this is maybe a little bit technical, but the way that these manifestations most uh, often manifest themselves is in nightmares, in disturbed sleep.
And normally we have rested sleep and we wake up and we're fresh. But people who have these the memories under their skin are waking up at night or they cannot fall asleep because they have these nightmares that are waking them up or preventing them to go for sleep. But it also can happen during daytime when there are uh, these triggers that remind them of the events that occur. That's one category. The other one is what we call avoidance. They try to block out remembrances or reminders of these events that have happened by not going to places, by not going to people, by not trusting people anymore. That's the second sort of category. And the third one is irritability, is uh, easily startled, uh, jumpy and that kind of things. These are the three things that can be very bothersome uh, on top of things that people feel like I lost the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. I should have died on the battlefield and I'm still alive and why bother? It can have an existential connotation that people find very difficult to survive or to struggle with. There's so much that's so interesting in here, Eric. I mean, the sort of the evolution of our understanding of mm -hmm. this, you know, certainly through the brutality of the types of war that we fought in the last 150 years, the trauma that that entailed of the whole generation in the First World War followed very rapidly by a second generation in the Second World War and the evolution of our understanding of shell shock uh, and then <laughs> becoming psychotrauma and us understanding more about it. But how would you characterize our increased understanding of this as a field that merits real epidemiological focus, if you want to call it that? I didn't want to interrupt you, but yes, we've had a legacy of several wars. And actually, we thought that this was never going to happen. And we have another war that's ongoing in Ukraine. So as we speak, we see the brutality of war. We see the sexual violence of war. And we felt like, no, this is never going to happen. And it is happening in front of our eyes. The things that we hear are devastating and we will hear for the next couple of years or decades probably from what has been going on there. And um, yeah, the lessons that we have learned from previous wars hopefully will help us to get a better deal in helping the ones that are now exposed to these brutalities of the war. But still, it is devastating. It still is. So what are the weaknesses and the failings in the way that we currently treat PTSD and psychotrauma? Yeah. yeah, I like that question a lot because in the last sort of two decades, I and others have invested very much in destigmatizing PTSD in the military and in uniformed professionals in particular. So the problem typically is, and I'm not referring to the English only, but others is like stuff it up, like I'm okay and pretend that everything is okay. And you can do that in the service that's ongoing and I don't want to lose my profession as a fireman or or a police officer or so, but yeah, don't stuff it up and acknowledge that something's haunting you. So we need to, as professionals and as scientists, destigmatize the disorder and tell people, come early. Because if you come early for treatment, the better the prognosis is. If you wait five years and if you feel cognitive avoidance and you drink and you drink more and you're brutal to your wife or your kids or so and another marriage and another marriage, then it's going to be very difficult. So the earlier you can do something to intervene, the better the prognosis is. At some cases, it is so well that you will not lose your profession. So if you're early in the military and if you have been in Afghanistan and you have these nightmares and, and peers tell you like, hey, something's bothering you, go seek help because you will be able to stay in your armed forces and you can keep your profession. You can be proud of your profession. You can continue to make a living out of that. So that's kind of a long answer, but I think that is the big lesson that we have learned. Come in early and don't stigmatize. So can we turn to sort of talking a little bit about what you're researching? Could you describe sort of the new therapeutic areas that you're looking at? You know, the use of drugs which have previously been used in psychiatry, but maybe not in this area, that have fallen out of favor and are now coming back to the fore and we're seeing increased studies in the use of them. Well, not for no reason. I said that I'm in Leiden. And mm. in Leiden, there was a colleague psychiatrist by the name of Jan Bastians, who was looking before we had PTSD at the concentration camp syndrome, people who survived Auschwitz or the major concentration camps and survived these camps, but were tormented with these memories. And what Bastians did, there was pre-PTSD, he used psychedelics to intervene, to give people, quote unquote, their lives back. 
in order to give them a sort of verbatim, give them the ability to explore things that they have not been able to revisit after they survived the camps. So Jan Bastians used LSD and psilocybin and ketamine. And this was 50 years ago. And then, of course, there was the backlash that these psychedelics were kind of forbidden and a lot of negative press about the use of psychedelics. But recently, these psychedelics, the last 10, 15 years, have shown us the potential, specifically in severe cases of PTSD. It's not in the early cases, like I just said, if it's there for a half a year or so after you return from Afghanistan. No, in these really difficult, complex cases, we see that these compounds that we've known for years have great potential. And what, I mean, you mentioned sort of LSD and psilocybin and then ketamine. My limited understanding is that LSD and psilocybin are of a type. Ketamine is slightly different. What is it that sort of lumps them together as psychedelics in this kind of setting as a therapeutic? What are they doing that's similar to each other? Well, you know, we all lump them as psychedelics, mind manifesting, as they open the mind. So they reveal things that are otherwise hidden. And we lump them together as if they're all psychedelics, but ketamine is not really a psychedelic and MDMA is not really a psychedelic. It's a psycholithic. It will be too detailed to go and unravel all these discrete pieces Mm -hmm. when you do a call it psychedelic and when we're not. But for the sake of now, let's call them all psychedelic and they have mind manifesting capacities. They provide a window to the inside of the person, the soul, if I may use that word now, that otherwise are very hard to get at with ordinary psychotherapeutic processes. So, you know, they allow people to kind of explore things that perhaps are very difficult to talk about. How related to the actual biological mechanism of action is there? Are you prescribing the drug or are you prescribing the psychedelic experience? Is it that you use LSD for one type of PTSD or one kind of thing and psilocybin for another and ketamine for another and an MDMA for another? Or is it something about the common kind of opening up that's actually being prescribed? The way you say it is proper. The opening up is what we prescribe. And we use these compounds catalyst, catalyst to a psychotherapeutic process. And they may have also healing capacities. Yes, they're serogenergic agents and they have a potential to also do something that we call psychoplastic in the brain. They make new connections. But what we really think that matters most is that they're catalysts to the psychotherapeutic process. So they allow the process to manifest in a way that was, I wouldn't say not able before, but more difficult. It's very interesting. So what was the trigger in the last 10 or 15 years that's kind of really started people exploring this? Because we've seen a lot of it come through in mental health research, in the treatment of persistent depression, you know, alongside talking therapies and what we might now think of as very brutal therapies, um, such as electroshock therapy in the 60s and 70s. So um, what has kind of triggered the renewed interest? Is it that people are more relaxed about these types of drugs now? Or is it that there's clinical data coming through that shows that this really could be something that could fall into the mainstream treatment paradigm? I think both. There are new data that are really supportive. When I was shown about five, six years ago, the data with MDMA assisted psychotherapy for severe PTSD, and I was shown that the people after two sessions of MDMA didn't meet criteria for PTSD no more. I almost fall off my chair. It's like, wait a minute, when have we seen that last? And that, in addition to a sort of a mindset that is like opening up, like, hey, a sort of a more lean forward, like, what is this? It's not toxic. It's not addictive. These are things that may have been true 20 years ago, but we moved beyond that. And another layer to that also, we are interested in these, let's call them altered state of consciousness. Now, I had a profound interest in hypnosis years back, and hypnosis is also an altered state of consciousness that doesn't have to do with drugs or so, but exploring your inner mind. And you can go very far in looking at visualization and exploring and words and meaning and narrative meanings of words. But it's fascinating to see if you then add MDMA to that process, it deepens the experience to such a level that is um, is fascinating. And it's not fascinating for me as a therapist, it's fascinating for the patient that feels that he or she has access to things that were deeply hidden or unaccessible. 
And so it's not just the brain and the mind are, you know, still real mysteries. It's the fact that our own mind is a real mystery to ourselves, you know, specifically, isn't it? Yeah, I'll give you one example that has had a profound meaning for me. And typically you hear that when people take psilocybin, it is in a way that psilocybin brings you closer to quote unquote nature. And we often have these hatred feelings of being angry at the aggressor or being angry at the Germans for what they did in the Second World War or angry for the assailant. But in the psilocybin experience, sometimes profound experiences can occur that alter a belief setting. And the belief setting could sometimes be like, but we're all human. You're as human and I am. And we were in a different situation back then. And you did gruesome things, but we're all human. And that kind of, we belong to the same planet. We belong to the same. I know that this can sound flaky if I say this, but if somebody experiences it and somebody can forgive the Nazis for what they've done in the camps and have a profound like, hey, the Nazis were also human. And, and you can't think yourself out of that, but you have to feel with your soul that that's a truth that is very important for you. Then it may happen that these nightmares stop haunting yourself. He said it sounds flaky. And of course, you know, there's still look, the stigma associated with the disease. There's also stigma associated with the therapy here as well. And there's a challenge in that often the description of the therapeutic process here does feel flaky. But it sounds to me like you're talking about a consistent set of described experiences by many, many patients saying the same kind of thing about the experience they've had. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And that's the beauty of what we see now in science. We see that we can replicate things, we can predict, we can identify who will benefit from it and who will probably not. So we can stratify people who may get a good signal out of psilocybin or MDMA or ketamine. Now, the next one is then to make it more accessible and train therapists that are able to deliver this therapy in the way that it should be delivered. Because what I would say, Connor, is like, don't try this at home. And don't do it on yourself because it still is psychotherapy. It still is people that are going into a psychotherapeutic process that is catalyzed by these compounds. In the same way, we would never expect people to perform an appendectomy on themselves. Exactly. This is the kind of thing that you need, you know, trained professional guidance with. Yes. How is the field evolving, Eric? What does a therapeutic session look like? And then what's next in terms of making sure that the right kind of support exists around the patients and the therapists and the institutions? The working mechanism is so profoundly different because we come from an era where you would take your medication every day. You take your SSRI every day and then you will get better. Here, you don't take medication every day. You take it maybe twice. And the therapy, an experimental session with MDMA, starts at nine and it ends at five. So it's an eight hour session. And you need two of these sessions a month apart. And in between of these sessions, you will have weekly, what we call integrative sessions, where you reflect on what has been going on in these long therapy sessions. It's a completely different working mechanism. And you don't have to take MDMA later every day. No, not at all. You take it twice, three times, and that's it. So it's a different conceptualization of how therapy unfolds there. So what we need to do is um, explore for whom this is beneficial. We need to provide training opportunities for people who like to do these therapies. We need to get regulatory agencies to prescribe the MDMA and the psilocybin. Then there's a whole recreational arm of using drugs, but I'm using it as a psychiatrist, as a doctor. So I brand them as medicines. So I don't care so much what people do recreationally, and I have nothing to say about that, but I would like to preserve these compounds as medicines. And I'd like to see that centers with a good certification track record and good training would have the ability to use this, let's call it compassionate care. In the absence of formal approval at the level of the FDA, for instance, let's do compassionate care because it works. And specific centers would then have the opportunity to deliver this care to the people who are really in need. In the military, it's like no drugs. But here we're talking about medicines. And I know he's now retired. Nick Carter was a high uh, general in the British Armed Forces. And he endorsed the use of MDMA for veterans who are suffering from PTSD. And I think if the leadership then shows that there's a lean forward to exploring these drugs for medicinal purposes, I think, okay, that's where we need to go. 
And you're, you're mentioning guilt or so. And let me say two words, if you're okay. Well, guilt is a very hard to tackle emotional quality and anger and rage and shame. And what we typically see is when we use these compounds, that guilt is sort of as if it's melting, as if guilt is opening up. And guilt can haunt people for years. And some people have revenge and feelings of hatred. And these compounds can really help to facilitate those processes and that they are becoming um, I say useless or no, having a different having a different atmosphere, having a different quality that are not haunting people in their lives. So to, to go back to your first question, if the leadership then endorses the experimental nature of these compounds, I think we can do a lot for service members who are haunted and lead terrible lives now. Eric, this has been absolutely fascinating. I could go on forever and ever and ever. I find this, you know, it's so interesting in terms of the progress that's being made. My last question is, what's the sort of the next big step that has to happen to make this move in the right direction? I mean, what are you waiting on? What's the mountain to climb, you know, today in our lifetime such that we leave uh, something for the next generation to build on? Well, it's happening already. I think there's a new generation that is, uh, as I said, leaning forward. I teach to students and they really get it. So they also read the book of Michael Pollan. And Armit, I think also you're representative of a new generation. I'm 60, so okay, I'm incentivized by this. This is not something that we can sort of halt or stop. So it's gonna be there, we have to regulate it. So what I feel is we've lost it in the 60s or the 70s. We should not lose it this time. We should be careful, protective about it, teach the younger generation, and hope that it will stay as a tool that can benefit many, many people. Superb, Eric. Is there anything that you thought we should mention or say, aside from, look, don't try this at home, we're talking about therapy, we're not talking about, you know, recreational use of these compounds. Is there anything else you think we should have touched on that we didn't? Well, uh, a lot. <laughs> we come from an era where everything was different. When I was trained as a resident in psychiatry, there was no MDMA and there was no psilocybin. And I had to read it from the books of Jan Bastians from 50, 60 years ago. And we have to sort of regain that momentum. And we are regaining that momentum if I look at what's now in literature. And if you just Google psychedelics, man, it's brutal. So it's, it's maybe a hype for at least some, but um, there is a strong signal. So yeah, you got me in my talking mode here and being enthusiastic about this. And I feel in these, like we talked about stigma and about the most difficult to treat PTSD patients. And the problem that I face most is when people have existential guilt and they commit suicide because life is not a place where they want to be at anymore. And if this compound can help them to have a perspective of life, that life is becoming meaningful again, and that they have an opportunity for reconciliation, then uh, life is a fun place to be. Oh, Connor, that was a delightful conversation. I see why you didn't have the heart to cut out any of the details. You know, while I was listening, I was thinking about all the, there's a current trend in Hollywood or on streaming services where humans are messing with memory as a kind of cure for PTSD. So I think it's just fascinating to hear what a real scientist is thinking in Eric's perspective on the topic of psychotraumatology. I know, it's, I could have kept him on the phone for hours and hours, and he was so kind with his time. Um, it's just another example of how curiosity can take us in so many different directions. But look, that's all we could squeeze into this episode. So do check the show notes for more details. Our executive producer is Andrea Killen, and this podcast is produced with the help of Bethany Grace Armit Brewster. She does a fabulous job editing, mixing, and music is by Tom Henley and the marvelous people at Banda Productions. My name is not Dodie Axelson. And my name is not Connor McKechnie. Make sure you rate us on Spotify or whichever platform you use. If you're listening on Spotify, we do have a poll under the episode description. It would help us if you answered that, please. It makes us better. See you when we come back with another episode of Discovery Matters.